today's webinar. So real quick, I'm Skylar with Lean Frontiers. On our screen, you can see Oscar and a few of the people from Story Construction. You will receive a link from me within 24 to 48 hours um, to view the recording. And I think that's all from me. Oscar, your turn. <laughs> good on you. Thank you, Skylar. And the kids kept quiet in the background. That's, that's okay, good. Very, very well, very well managed. <laughs> Uh, so th as I always say, thanks, Skylar, that work that goes on in the background and Jim to, to a certain extent to bring these to life is important to acknowledge. So thank you for that. So we've got three people from Story Construction. We've got Mitch Anderson, who's the Marketing Development Manager, and we've got Brant Carr, who's the Pre-Construction Manager, and Troy Turner is the Senior Project Manager, all from Story Construction in Ames, Iowa. So before they talk, I'm just going to set some foundations and I'm going to introduce a model uh, that really forms the basis of what's been happening at Story in this uh, field. So you should all be able to see a PowerPoint screen uh, in the, and we're just introducing this model of the knowledge threshold, which those of you who are familiar with Mike Rother's work may well have uh, or will have seen to a certain extent. Now, I'm not going to go into this in a whole lot of detail. But firstly, we've got a picture of the brain in the middle. And the point there is that the brain uh, consumes a lot of energy. Thinking consumes a lot of energy. And why does this happen? And how does this happen? Because what we did in situation A worked. Sorry, how does this connect? Because what we did in situation A worked, our brain likes to tell us that the same thing will work in situation B. So that's a mechanism for the brain uh, reducing the consumption of energy, which goes back to be a survival mechanism. Uh, it's a survival uh, attribute from um, years and years gone by. Taking this a little bit further, from the Toyota Car to Practice Guide, our brain fills in the blanks. So it does this to, to save energy. It does it automatically quickly and silently and as this little arrow would indicate it jumps something now it jumps what mike refers to as the current knowledge threshold and i heard mike speak about the current knowledge threshold many 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 times and it wasn't sinking in as to what it was except about the 12th time i've probably heard him say it he said the knowledge threshold is where facts and data end so the knowledge threshold is where facts and data end now so if you take this to the next slide, then if something we're about to do has never been done before in the environment we tend to do it in, and that includes the people, then we are beyond our knowledge threshold. So if something we're about to do has never been done before in the environment we intend to do it in, and that includes with this group of people, we are beyond our knowledge threshold. And I think certainly in, uh, in continuous improvement, and you can underpin that by whatever you like. This is happening all the time. We're always taking new things into a, in an environment. We think we've done it before, but if we've got a different set of people in particular, we don't have facts and data for that situation, so we're beyond our knowledge threshold. The point, therefore, is that many actions perhaps would be better approached as experiments. Now, before we get into these three guys talking, that I think ticks off a couple of questions that were submitted. So Holly Hankinson when she registered asked by experimenting do you mean in the context of carter so carter is a couple of patterns that help us get towards uh moving from a to b and thinking scientifically while doing so so if we uh, if we acknowledge that's what carter is and we, we want to get from a to b scientifically thinking then experiments are going to be important another one was uh, uh where is it to Jennifer Dieter said, who do you mean by people in terms of story? Uh, anyone in the organisation? Yes, anyone in the organisation. These guys are senior people and they've been involved, all been involved in practising workplace experimenting. And the third one was uh, Dan Roth from Go Lean Consulting. He said, I assume there needs to be training on lean, CI, PDCA before the experimenting in the workplace. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's not correct. Certainly in PDCA, but the pull for PDCA comes from whatever uh, whatever mechanism you've got of getting from A to B, whatever mechanism you may, may have. And really, that's not overly important. So no, in this case, and in, I would argue in many cases, there's no need to have that training to start with. 
because it's a fundamental skill. So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to Mitch. And Mitch is going to, uh, sorry, Brant Carr. And Brant's going to talk to us about how Story's structured system of facilitating PDCR, how it actually came about. So over to you, Brant. Yeah, thanks, Oscar. Uh, good introduction. And I, I would say uh, really what we saw was a real need, uh, I'll say, to uh, build some muscle inside of our scientific thinking. So uh, Oscar's illustration and the knowledge of threshold really rings true for us and we could uh, so we're a, a construction company and we could go build the same building a couple of times uh, right after each other but the site's going to be different the trades that we're going to uh, are going to go do that with might be different so the the thinking and the concept of approaching that as an experiment it might be the same thing that we've done before but we're doing it with a new set of people is really disarming <clears throat> so it just lessens people's anxiety about having to have the right answer or the right thing to be able to go do. So it allows people's minds to be uh, open more really about trying some different things or some new things or some opportunities to improve. So that was one. And two, uh, we recognized that we really just needed to build uh, some skill set, give some people some tools in their toolbox to be able when we say go, uh, go do, uh, plan, do, check, and reflect. And you'll notice we use reflect and not act or adjust. I'll touch on that in just a minute. But as we say, here's the PDCR cycle. We were familiar with those terms. Our, our uh, company's familiar with those terms. What we are finding is that really the plans were probably too big. Um, they took too long and their eyes were bigger, uh, they were taking bigger chunks than what we really needed them to go do. So we needed to help them. How do we build skills and to be able to go do this? So this is where this uh, workplace experimenting came about. And we really put a solid structure around what does it mean to go do workplace experimenting? Um, we really, we have a standard around what does that look like? And it really helps people just walk through a standard practice and we wanna build behaviors and we wanna give them repetition in doing. So how do, we, how do we create a habit, right? So just repeat the cycle uh, repeatedly. And uh, as we went through this, people recognize, oh, this, isn't, this doesn't have to be that big. I can, I can make incremental improvement in my workplace in a variety of different ways. And that cycle time might be an hour, it might be half a day, it might be a day. For me to be able to That's run the cycle it, cycle time um, for the experiment, Brant, isn't it? The cycle time for the experiment. Correct. So I don't have to do an experiment for six months to be able to come up to what I need to do, and um, so that was important for us to like. How do we bite size chunk this and get it down to an individual level that they have tools to be able to go do this really on their own? And so we, we want to create the behavior and the culture that it's acceptable go, to go do and make a plan and, and go adjust. And I touched on the uh, PDCR, the reflection piece. And uh, here's- Just before you go on to that, yeah. Brant, can you, can you just, can you just maybe just go into a little bit, the fact that, that we want people to be thinking this way, but we don't want them to be thinking randomly. In other words, it's not do little, do little bits of improvement there, 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 you know, it's not ran it's not it's not random improvement, and I think that's an important point in this. Yeah, and as we go through this, we um, we want people to be able to improve in their workplace themselves, and so we we try to target and help guide uh, where people can go do, and we give uh, we give some examples for them to go practice that everybody can can use, um, and then we really want them to be inside of their work and to be able to do that. But we want it to be systematic in a way and strategic so that uh, it's coordinated and not chaotic. Um, but we give, we give pre, uh, people some freedom to be able to go choose what they want to go do. Um, PDCR, and then on the, I interrupted, you're on about PDCR. Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll touch on the, re, the reflection piece. So uh, people are accustomed to seeing the, the PDCA uh, we use the R, and and really the most important thing that we want people to get uh, out of that scientific thinking is the learning, right? So how do we focus them on the learning? Uh, we're really good as contractors to figure out, hey, there's a problem, I need to go solve it, and I'll act. 
So we don't we don't typically have an issue with people acting or going and doing. We wanted to insert strategically a piece in there that says reflect and just a brief pause. So we want you to go plan the work. We want you to go do your plan. We want you to check against the hypothesis that you uh, that you stated. And then quickly after that, so there's a check and then we move quickly into reflection. Based on what you checked, what did you learn? Like uh, you, you'll ask yourself some questions about why did things differ from my hypothesis? So we inserted the reflection piece, more of a pause for people to say, what did I learn? And then from what I learned, what will I go do next? And that lends itself into the next plan. So definitely a cycle. Um, we, uh, with the word adjust or act, uh, people would jump to that next piece. At least that's our, our experience. So we changed it to reflect, uh, help our people uh, just take a little bit of a pause. I think that's an important, a very important point to make that you guys by nature were planners and doers by nature in construction you're planners and doers so that was there to some extent to a certain extent that was there but was was what wasn't there was the checking and adjusting so you, it was the way you guys you know to use check and reflect that was i think the key thing in you what you said then brand was stop stop just take time and reflect and the word reflect helped get the message across of stop take a little bit of time Have, take a breath I think is what you said. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So there, um, who was it? Julie Anthony asked that question. We use the PDCA cycle, but I see this is PDCR and she essentially asked why. So Julie, there was the um, answer to that. So thanks, Brant, for covering that. Sure. Um, so then Mitch, so you, this, Mitch was a, when they put the first group in the um, system that we used to get this PDCR practice going, Mitch, uh, Pat Geary, who's the uh, Chief of, uh, of Operations, submitted Mitch, uh, was it Mitch's name into the group. And I thought, hang on, Mitch does marketing. What the hell is he doing here? That was my initial reaction. How, what's a marketing person doing involved in this? Mm -hmm. But um, Mark was uh, Mitch was a really positive contributor, and it, I found it fascinating what he, uh, and he and and his work colleague and how they applied it. So, Mitch, can you just tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, of course. So, um, a little background on our on our construction projects. We have a lean um, uh, a lean management process called Construction Production 2.0 that we use, and uh, it's got the trailer with the sticky notes and the planning. And so, we use that uh, for marketing as well, or at least some version of it. Part of that is planning out um, daily activities for this week's of work and the next two weeks of work as well. Um, and in doing this um, uh, workplace experiment uh, activity with uh, you guys, um, we were tasked with kind of identifying a problem or, or identifying a, a, uh, something to improve upon uh, in, our, in our work. And what I what I ended up thinking of was when uh, myself and my intern look at that uh, this week's work and the next two weeks work and we put the planning um, sticky notes up, we would look at our um, next two weeks of work, the two week look ahead, and it was kind of sparse. It was uh, it, there were less work activities populated than we had for this week's of work, and um, we kind of. Uh, rack our brain and, and think that there should just be more on there, shouldn't there? Shouldn't we have more work activities planned over the next two weeks? So what we did is we used this um, workplace experimenting exercise, the, the PDCR, um, to run an experiment over the course of two weeks. And what that experiment was, was her and I, every time we would complete an activity at work, whether it was planned or not planned, uh, we'd write that activity down. And then we'd also write down, where did this activity originate? Did the activity originate in our weekly plan or the two week look ahead? And then also where should it have originated? So again, whether or not it was actually planned, we'd write down where should this have originated? Should we have seen this work activity coming in the two week look ahead or even beyond that? Should it have been in our phase pool production schedule You know, uh, that we could see coming for a couple months even? Uh, what we found, so so I guess I'll 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 say our, our check. We found that about seventy percent of the activities that we wrote down over the course of those two weeks 
it was 70% of them um, originated or, or should have originated in this week's work or, or in our weekly plan. So, so pretty nearsighted. Um, so basically just what so, that, just, just so yeah. we understand that what you're saying there is that 70% of the work was appearing, seeming to appear, but actually it was, it, it was known to be present. It just wasn't, pla it wasn't on the board as such. Um, well, so I, that's what, so we were thinking that we should be seeing a lot of this work coming in the in the two week look ahead, but we recorded when we, when we did these activities, we recorded when should we have seen these coming? And, yeah, right. and we found that seven. And again, I, sh I should say that this is the number of activities, not necessarily the time spent, right? No, 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 no. Um, 70% of the activities should have, uh, we, we should not have expected them to come any later or any further ahead than, than uh, the weekly plan. So we basically were able to give ourselves a little bit of grace and say, it's okay that that two week look ahead doesn't have as many items as our weekly plan has. But yeah. I'd say when it comes to reflecting, it did um, allow us to have the discussion, you know, should we, should we really have so much, so many activities occurring? So, so, uh, coming into the work funnel. So, um, without very much notice, I guess you could say, um, and that actually prompted a follow-up experiment where rather than just the number of activities, we recorded how much time we were spending on those activities to try to determine, you know, how much time are we actually spending on some of these things that get, you know, whether it comes from uh, some other department or some other project, um, for an example, uh, a pursuit, so a, a proposal to get to get work, that that usually doesn't come further ahead than the two week look ahead. That usually doesn't come on the on as far out on the phase pull production schedule. So we could have the discussion, you know, um, let's run this other experiment that tells us how much time we're spending on some of these shorter term things as opposed to longer range initiatives or projects. Um, and, and so we did run that and we were able to have some discussions and that, that can help influence, you know, do we need to be kind of pushing more work away or, or delegating some of these tasks so we're not having to do them and we can spend on the, uh, more important work. Um, so that was really good. Uh, and, and that was kind of our reflection. So I think a couple of important things in there, Mitch, one is it allowed it, 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 it the pattern and the standard and the mechanism helped you study the work in a logical manner one of a better description but the interest other interesting thing it's said that your reflection led you into another pdcr cycle and so on and so forth and that's a very important factor here and so the brand highlighted it we're talking about frequent uh shortish pdcr cycles not one big one but frequent shortish and we just keep going and, and that's what we're trying to encourage at story is that we get this mentality of do the work and uh experiment with the work do the work partly part of your job but also study the work and uh, experiment with the work and I think that that's why I wanted you to tell that scenario because it highlights that so thank you mm -hmm. Troy you were involved in the second group I think it went through might have been the third and you saw a leader respond when they removed when they were moved from a restrictive environment to a small group on the P, um, on the uh, PDCR team so can you tell us about that? That was a very interesting one for me too. And I'll, I'll explain why at the end. Yep, sure will. Uh, so for a little background for the non-construction people that are on today, uh, who we're referring to is a project superintendent. And a project superintendent, uh, one way to think about it is they're kind of like the president and CEO of that job site. It's their job to lead and get that project done. Second thing I'd add is uh, this particular project, it's the first time this superintendent and I have worked together, even though we've both been here for many years, so we didn't have a background with each other. Uh, and it's on an industrial site, and our client produces uh, natural gas and ethanol, so it's a heavy construction site. Um, one thing, um, as we started talking about PDCR, the superintendent and I had several conversations around this idea of experimentation. And there's probably two key things of that. One was a lot of conversations about every project we do is really an experiment. Every project is a prototype. 
we've never built this before, so let's have that in the back of our mind. And one way to think about that is it's beyond the knowledge threshold. We've built similar things, but not this um, particular project. Second thing is um, conversations around, we are free to experiment and try new things. So let's try something and see what happens. Um, what I've found is a uh, superintendent has really just been, I think, freed up. So he's felt like he's got permission to experiment. And I think that's been helpful for him. Uh, second thing is, in all of this, we're really trying to develop people for the long haul. And that really resonated with this person in particular, because we, we were able to kind of look back 10 years and what the workforce looked like then. And there's some things we would like to have changed, honestly, if we could go back 10 years, but we can't. So let's look ahead 10 years and what do we want our leadership to look like in 10 years? And that really resonated with him. And um, so then we've used this PDCR uh, cycle. Um, currently, we're using it to develop people. Um, I think that's a I think that's a key point there, Troy. Is it is one of the it's going to be, and it's 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 it's, it's the vision is for this to be fundamental within anyone who works at Story, um, because. Uh, you know, because you're continually going beyond your knowledge threshold. What if I could just chime in there, this particular person without naming names, I'd worked with this person before on a another exercise and um, without being too disrespectful, the cooperation wasn't overly high. So when I saw this person's name on the list for uh, this particular exercise, getting involved with uh, workplace experimenting, I thought, oh, interesting choice. I wonder why. Uh, this probably won't go well again. So I, classic, I jumped beyond my knowledge threshold. I'd experienced with this person before, but not in this situation. So I did the, whatever, my brain filled in the blanks. And I thought, no, that's an odd choice. Anyway, this particular individual was a, a extremely positive contributor. It was refreshing. I thought, wow, where did that come from? Yeah. And I think one of the key things you said, Troy, was that it gave this person the freedom to the, the freedom to experiment, but it's not random. It's it's the freedom to experiment, and this is the pattern we're going to follow. It's not random experimentation, for want of a better word. And that was really that was really enlightening to me to realise that um, that it was revealing for me that I jumped beyond my knowledge threshold. Uh, I'd had preconceived ideas, but actually, when you change the environment, this person was an extremely positive and valuable contributor in that group. Yeah, and that's some of the feedback I've gotten. So within our company, certainly we have people that see uh, this individual from project to project. And I've had several comments that, wow, there is a marked positive difference how he is going about his work on this project. Yeah, And so right. that, that's, that's been neat to see. Good. Uh, I'll just get into a couple of questions that have been submitted. I don't mind who answers this, but um, of, of the three of you, James Addis, and this is an important one, how to deal with managers who are expecting big bang improvements? How does that, has that been something that's experienced at Story? I, perhaps not, but just which of you, one of you would like to comment on that. How do you deal with managers who are expecting big bang improvements? I don't think it has been something you've suffered from, but please. Well, and I'll, I'll start and then Mitch or Troy can add in. So uh, our our path forward really was to take it from a bigger chunk. And so sometimes managers will want like uh, we want to hit a home run on the first one. We want to hit consistent singles. And so our I'd say our strategically, our mindset has been different. Yeah. Uh, and so we want very small incremental improvements starting where anybody where where they're at. Uh, so we're, like Troy said, we're in this for the long haul. And so we know in time we're going to score a ton of runs, uh, but we don't need to hit home runs every time we get up to bat. Uh, we need to be hitting consistent singles. And when we do that, people are going to score uh, and we're going to see successes and we're going to see more singles than we are home runs. 
So that's the methodology that we applied to it. And that's probably one reason why our leadership team and our management team wasn't saying, oh, I need to see a huge return on whatever investment that we have. Uh, we know that investment will grow in time. And uh, we're just looking to, to uh, take small chunks out of that uh, each bite. Yeah, so James, the important thing there is it's coming down from the top. It's coming from the top. It's it's a strategic objective to develop this thinking and as and lots of they know that they will get lots of home, lot lots of lots of singles will add up to home runs. And I would say it's something we had to overcome. So twenty four years ago, we were more looking for home run hitters. Twelve years ago, we really shifted our mentality to. No, we're looking for singles. <laughs> Very well put. Um, and Louise has asked, Louise Finnan from Kenya, New England, has asked, how do you carve out time for workplace experimenting? I could, I guess my answer to that would be um, for us, um, we sort of built it into our existing processes more or less. So my intern and I, we had, we have daily or uh, at least weekly conversations um, at our planning board. And so using that time to implement some of this PCR and then, um, you know, the rest of the experiment was really just documentation. Uh, that was, that was kind of our personal experiments. And that's, that's how I would try to approach it going forward as well. I'd probably add it to the question gets to how do you how do you add this in or, or how that and I would say we don't approach it as a bolt on. And Troy, Troy's example was a really good one. Uh, everything we do, we want to look at as an experiment. So whether we recognize it or not, we're doing this cycle. So it's just really what we do. We want to build the strategic habit uh, and behavior to follow a pattern. So it's targeted versus uh, random. So uh, we want to build it into what we do. I'd say specifically this training is it's, pretty, it's meant to be fairly quick and light that we can work into what we're doing. So try not to burden people with too much uh, training on how to go to do this, but we want to give them some skills to be able to go do this in what they do and not bolt something else onto what's already been doing. That's good. So there's a quick, thanks, um, Brent. There's a question come in from Paul Martel. It says, given the nature of your business, did you have to provide specific guardrails on where experimentation is encouraged and where it is discouraged to avoid significant risk? I would say, um, go ahead, Troy. Yeah, I would say it's something that we do need to be aware of. I mean, there is certain um, <laughs> threshold of risk that, that we need to be aware of. Uh, so like safety is a key one that comes to mind that, uh, there's certain things we can experiment, but it's to improve it and not get outside of the box of risk. And I think I'll throw in there too. So in this learning system that we have for getting people started with workplace experimenting, they, they, they do, firstly, they do a cycle on their own on a topic we give them, which is very, it's interruptions at work. So we give them a topic, they do a cycle. Then they choose their own cycle but we, and then we get back, then what we ask them to do is do the plan and then we get back together. So before you do the do, check and reflect, we're going to come back together once you've done the plan and confirm what it is. There's a, so there's a couple of things there. One is we encourage them to do something very small and the second on their, on their chosen one. And the second thing is we do get them back together and discuss the plan as a group before they do the do. So there's an opportunity there to say, hey, woo, if, if there's a high risk, but that hasn't happened yet because we're getting into the focus on small things, I think is probably the reason for that. Um, there was another question uh, Nicole has asked, and then we need to pull up because we're just about there. What was the, what has people's initial response to the PDCR program been or, and how did, did their outlook change over time, if anything? So perhaps, one of you three can answer that as to what was your initial response and did it change over time? Troy, why don't you take that one? Yeah, so I'll, I'll use my superintendent as an example. Yeah, um, good. Yep, there is a fair amount of skepticism there at first, I would say. Um, it's been overcome 
how did we overcome that for this particular individual? It's about selling them on the future and how this might benefit in the long term. Um, I th I think that's it. But yeah, sure. I like any new thing. There's going to be some skepticism and some resistance. So then it kind of gets into the JR program, job relations program of um, how do we overcome that? I think one of the things that's important, and then I've got a slight a finishing note, is it, when people realize that it actually increases their freedom. It will actually give them a level of freedom in their work to experiment within the box of risk. That's helpful. I'm just going to finish by sharing the screen again, and the, I want to throw something up. That's uh, in, in Spear and Bowen wrote an article in 1999 called the decoding the decoding the DNA of the Toyota production system, and in that article, it implies through a few words uh, or states actually that the Toyota production system is a community of scientists performing continual experiments, a community of scientists form, performing continual experiments, that. As I understand it, its vision is one of the is visionary for story. That's where story are trying to uh, uh, aiming. It's one of the places story is aiming to head over the years to come. Uh, Mitch, Brant, and Troy, thank you very, very much for your time in this, and thank you for the questions that came in beforehand. We've got through some of them, and thanks for the couple of the questions that came in. If you've got any, uh, if you've got any particular questions for any of the three, email Skylar. She can send it to me, and I will put you directly in contact with either with any of these three guys. They are they are very uh, keen to they're very willing to help uh, discuss their learnings and and um, what they and how the company's benefiting. So thanks, guys. Much appreciated. You bet. Thanks, You're Oscar. Welcome. Thank you so much. Also, just a quick reminder, Story Construction will be at the TWI and Cotta Summit coming up in April, and Oscar will be there as well. And also, look for a link from me within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day.